Welcome to another episode of Fight the Burnout. Today we have a uh, special guest, as we always have special guests, but today I'm excited because uh, it's somebody that I met on LinkedIn, we connected, and then we actually met in person at a wellness conference that I invited her to come along to, that I got invited to. It's a long story there, but I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit. But Stephanie uh, today is going to talk to us about her placing career. Uh, and also now uh, what she's gotten into now that she's gone into mental wellness and mental health um, training and coaching and and a program that she's created and a book that's not just for law enforcement, but you guys law enforcement out there are going to really love this. So that I stop botching all of this up, as I always say, I probably will uh, because I know I'm human. Uh, Stephanie, why don't you take it away? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your background, your policing, uh, how you got to where you are now. And then we'll go into kind of more about probably how we met. And, you know, it's going to be a good conversation, some good tools. But before you do that, I'm going to stop for a second and remind everybody. I always say this at the beginning and also at the end, so long as I remember. Take one thing away from today. You know, if it's that you go look at Stephanie's course, if you go, you know, look at getting it, getting her book, or that you just take one thing away from that is said today, take it away and actually start putting it into action. There is so much information out there. You know, a lot of what we talk about is not new things. It's just said in a different way to a different audience. But most people aren't taking action on these things. And that's the problem that we have these days is the action. So get out there, take action, just pick one thing, run with it. Put it into place and you'll watch yourself be a completely different person in 365 days. So without further ado, Stephanie, tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself. Yeah, I love that. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, first, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to uh, to chat about some stuff that I know you and I are uh, very passionate about. Um, I think sort of nutshell version, uh, a little bit about myself. I am, kind of have a multifaceted identity these days. Um, I'm a law enforcement veteran. I uh, am a former dispatcher. I'm a mom of two little boys. I am a wife to a deputy. I'm also um, the daughter of two parents that were in law enforcement. So uh, cop blood sure runs in my family, that's for sure. Um, but I think my my first start uh, in law enforcement started for me uh, in 2006, I suppose, professionally. Uh, both my my folks are retired police officers. And so uh, I grew up in law enforcement sort of as a child, but I didn't really have my foot in the door until 2006. Um, and that was where I started a sort of a, a non-sworn job with my local department. And I knew early on that I wanted to be in law enforcement, but I probably being stubborn a little bit, didn't want anything to do with being a cop. I uh, didn't want to follow in my parents' footsteps initially. So I kind of figured that I would stay doing some sort of a non-sworn route like dispatch. Um, and so ultimately I did go that route. I became a dispatcher and I really liked the job, but I wasn't, I don't know, like I wasn't really completely fulfilled in terms of being able to help people. I just felt like, you know, being being in what we called the dungeon, uh, cause we were like in the basement down below from everything behind the headset. I just, I felt like I could be doing more to help people. So um, I kind of had that internal uh, battle going on when I was a, a dispatcher, but I, I stayed uh, for a little time and, and, and sort uh, tried to sort of sort it out. So while I was a dispatcher in uh, 2011 was probably the biggest trajectory educationally and then eventually professionally for me. Uh, and this year, I was still non sworn, I was still a dispatcher. And I really had my first, first hand look and experience with first responder suicide. Uh, and I, I really saw the impact that workplace contributing factors had on someone's suicide ideations, and then therefore behaviors. Uh, he was my boyfriend at the time and was uh, a, a longtime friend. We had been friends for several years before we um, turned anything romantic, but sort of in a nutshell, uh, in, in October of 2011, uh, he was a cop. I was a dispatcher. We worked for two different agencies that were about 30 minutes apart. And 
initially he and I had really bonded over having police dads. Uh, our dads actually worked at the same agency uh, that my boyfriend was a cop at. Um, so it was them three at one department, me at a, another department. And I think we kind of bonded over having a, a similar upbringing. Um, us cop kids were sort of a social outcast a little bit. <laughs> Whether so, or not so I hear, I can't relate to that one, but so I hear, yep, <laughs> I can so see I it. Think, I think he and I sort of bonded over that. But where we were very different for him, his job in being a cop was his total identity. I mean, he ate, drank, and and breathed police work. Like that's who he was. So long story short, in 2011, uh, he was working his normal graveyard shift and had learned that an IA, an internal affairs investigation, was sort of coming down the pipe for him. And, you know, I used to talk about the reason behind the IA, but but honestly, I don't anymore because whether or not the allegations were true or not, I really don't think the outcome would have been any different here. Um, because of this over-identification piece, I really do think that any threat to him losing his job, his identity, I don't think the outcome would have been any different. Um, so on the shift that I think he thought was his last shift before he was put on um, administrative leave for this investigation, uh, he made the very permanent decision to shoot himself on duty uh, with his duty weapon um, uh, on patrol just outside of his patrol car. Um, so there were there were certainly a lot of factors that were sort of a culmination of everything um, that led up to this point. Uh, I think there were certainly some organizational failures during this time, uh, a lot of traumatic stuff and calls that really changed him as a person. Uh, definitely some personal failures for sure. And it kind of all stems from really, I don't think he had adequate coping skills in place to really work through and process everything, which which I think is really important to mention because from his experience and then from, from what I've seen and studied, you know, without these healthy coping skills in place, especially for law enforcement, we as humans, oftentimes resort to impulsive pleasure-seeking behaviors as a way to cope with what we cannot process. And so behaviors such as affairs or bad money moves that feel good in the moment, but uh, really set us up poorly in the future, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. For my boyfriend, um, these things were true and, and for a lot of other people as well. And so as you can imagine, uh, this uh, event very much affected me, obviously his family and, and really our whole department for a long time. So this event really started this sort of obsessive curiosity about studying suicide. Like I wanted to know why would somebody even think the thoughts that created this? How did it, how did it come to this? What, what contributed to this? And so, um, I got my bachelor's in psychology at this point, I went to any and all trainings on suicide, suicide prevention. Um, I started delving a little bit at this time, not entirely, which I do now, but at this time, a little bit into the work side uh, aspect of things, um, but really to get an overall sense of studying this darkness that that so many first responders find themselves in. So that's sort of how how I got started. <laughs> and <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, it, you know, it's, 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 I've talked to, you know, a lot of people and I know you've talked to a lot of people as well, getting to where you are now. And it's incredible how something from out of something traumatic comes something that like comes this passion, this drive for just drive for things. I'm curious, it's just popped in my head. So I'm curious. So I'm going to ask the question. Why do you think that is with your research, with what you found? Why do you think that humans, we, take something that's painful and we go, wait a second, I'm going to dive into that instead of run from it. Because mm -hmm. as law enforcement, we do that. You know, it's the number one thing that we're the best at as law enforcement is running towards danger. We don't run away from it. And in fact, sometimes we need to run away from it and we don't. Uh, why do you think that that's such the case with this? But then for, and then the follow-up question to that is, why do you think that law enforcement eventually get to that, some of them get to that stage where they just go, no, I'm going to run from it and I'm going to end it all. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely uh, really good questions. I, I think for me, faith was a big part of my story, especially with some stuff that I dealt with um, years after my boyfriend's suicide. Uh, and I once heard, I don't remember where I heard this, but I once heard someone say, you know, you've been through a lot of shit. What if just, just what if you turned that pain into purpose? And so for me, that really spurred this desire to turn that pain into purposeful, intentional helping of others because of my boyfriend's story of my own story, frankly, because I, if I can prevent someone from having to go through that pain, that psychological pain, whether or not it has the end result of my boyfriend's, just to avoid that psychological pain and know where to turn, know and recognize that these are things that they should be cognizant of is a win for me. And so I think really having that mindset of turning this pain into purpose has been really helpful for me. Um, and, and, you know, I, it took me a while to, to go into the sworn route, you know, like I didn't, I didn't really see that side of things for a while. Um, it wasn't until 2017, uh, I found myself, uh, going through a divorce with my first husband and I had a one-year-old son. And at that time I was working part-time dispatch. And so obviously from a financial standpoint, that wasn't going to sustain us. And so, Naturally, I think because of my upbringing, because I was comfortable around cops since I had grown up around them, um, the sort of next rung on that ladder for me was the police academy. Um, and so I did that. And and it was almost like, I know the police academy, you know, it has its own stressors and certainly is difficult at times. But for me, I actually really enjoyed it because law enforcement was was a really big part of my identity. And I think I didn't really know it until then. And, you know, I can remember times where I was a little girl, maybe, maybe seven or eight, and I would go to the police station with my dad, because he has, you know, a lot of reports to catch up on and shit ton of paperwork and whatever. And I would bring my little Barbies or toys or whatever. And I would play in the report writing room as he's catching up on whatever he needed to catch up. So I, I literally grew up in law enforcement. So sort of returning to that, uh, along the sworn route was sort of, I don't know, cathartic for me in, in a way, because that was sort of my did, background. Did you have your bachelor's by that point or not? I had my bachelor's yeah. by that so point. You'd done not my master's, and, yeah. So you had done yeah. a lot of, you had done a lot of different stuff that would have prepped you really quite well. Also being a dispatcher would have helped as well, but prepped yes. you a lot for what you're, for the, for the dark side of policing, which, uh, yeah. uh, what we should call it. <laughs> Yeah, that foundation, the Dispatch Foundation was really, I, I think, really instrumental in, in my success and making everything just like a little bit easier, right? Like the police academy is going to suck no matter what, no matter what you do. But but it did make it, I think, a little bit easier to sort of transition into that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I did my cop job for a few years and I started seeing similar issues on the department side of things that contributed to sort of this umbrella term of, of a decline in employee mental health. Um, and so sort of, as you alluded to, that's sort of around the time that I decided I wanted to go back to school. And uh, I got my master's degree in what's called IO psych. So industrial and organizational psychology, again, with this emphasis in trying to figure out and highlight workplace contributing factors to suicide. Um, so I actually took on a full load while working my graveyard shift because there's uh, not a whole lot to do between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. when you're trying to stay awake. Yeah. <laughs> so a, a special, on especially on a Monday, Tuesday night normally. <laughs> yeah. Instead of going on Facebook, I would go and do work on my studies. And uh, that helped me to graduate in, in a little over a year. So I definitely sort of nice. fast tracked it. Um, but from that point over the next few years, I, I really, this, this, I, I, I always call it this obsessive curiosity really, really was in like an uptick. Like I really was all about researching, studying, going to like hundreds of hours of trainings, um, finding in myself and others, what really contributed to, to this workplace related sort of mental health decline, um, which sometimes resulted in suicidal ideations and behaviors. And I found 
four sort of overlapping similarities in, in a lot of the suicides, suicide ideations uh, that I knew of, that I studied. Um, I also did uh, for a time um, psychological autopsies. So after someone dies, sort of backtracking to figure out what led to that. And so the four things that I saw over and over and over again were one, isolation, whether perceived or real. Two, low self-esteem and or low self-efficacy, which is, you know, our confidence, our pride in ourselves. A uh, three, something that um, the renowned uh, psychologist Thomas Joyner calls acquired capability. And basically it's something that uh, we are desensitized in, in many different shapes and forms, but we're desensitized to the pain and suffering either of ourselves or others. And so uh, Dr. Joyner called it acquired capability because this is something that we acquire. It's not something that we are born with. Um, on the first responder industry uh, world, uh, I call it occupational trauma. Obviously, uh, we as first responders deal with this desensitization of pain and suffering every day, all day. Um, so that's number three. And then number four is a loss or perhaps confusion of our identity, which we know is really important in law enforcement. Uh, oftentimes, we perceive we our uh, we are our jobs. Like that is it. That is our end all be all. Um, so if there's any loss, any confusion of that identity, um, that can create really, really dark times. And so these four things, especially when experienced simultaneously, uh, create the perfect storm of something that that I now call work aside. So not suicide, which is death by self, not homicide, which is death by other, but work aside, spelled similarly, death by career. And this is especially true in our first responders. And so around this time, I sort of made some mental notes, continued to research uh, in hopes of, of starting to get to the place where I could help others, and frankly, myself in this occupation. I'm just gonna say, wow. Because as you're explaining that all out, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's definitely right. You know, isolation. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, I felt isolated. I, you know, if I look back, I felt like I was a bit bullied when I was first got in and I came into a team that hadn't had a new person in two, two and a half years. So naturally, you're going to be a little bit of an outsider. Self-esteem had been knocked many, many a times by people that I was working with because just the way that they were taught how to teach desensitization oh that was quick i went to my first dead body before i even graduated then six weeks out went to a guy who jumped in front of a train and like literally we just brushed it off you know uh and then loss of identity yeah like that one didn't hit me until i wasn't able to until i was told no you can't do our version of swat and then my whole life kind of felt like it fell apart. And I've done all this work looking back on it. So, yep, you're, you got me. You got me interested, Stephanie. Uh, yeah. All right. And to <laughs> yeah. clarify, I can too. Obviously, these are things that anyone, regardless of occupation yes. experience, but with first responders, from what I've seen, from what I've researched, this is is much more prevalent because of the nature of our jobs and sort of the this stress inoculation that really starts day one of the academy i i would put it it starts before that even it starts as soon as you decide you want to do it you know i train yeah. a lot of people fitness wise to get into the place i coach a lot of people i've spoken to a lot of ex and current cops because of obviously me getting burned out and getting to that stage where i wasn't suicidal but i didn't care if i died mm -hmm very steps off uh mm -hmm. but the reason i never got suicidal was because the suicides are what actually screwed me up the most and mm -hmm. i saw what i did to the families uh and but you know it's it's interesting because you go through those four lists and i actually i strongly believe and i'd love to know your input on this stephanie as well from you know having the the degrees and the papers and that and as well as the research that you've done for the book and the course but isolation, most cops that I've talked to, and my wife and I talk about this a lot, on isolation, 
I feel like, you know, you, you probably are familiar with gangs being law enforcement for a while, you know, probably dealt with a lot of, you know, motorcycle gangs and that. I find what I've found is they're not actually the people in motorcycle gangs and cops aren't actually that different. Just one's gone down the criminal route and one's gone down. I'm going to uphold the law because they're looking for some sort of belonging. Some, you know, most cops are looking for some sort of belonging, some sort of family because of something that's happened. Maybe their family wasn't there or maybe their family was there. So they want to bring that to other people. But that kind of almost counteracting the isolation side of stuff, the low self-esteem. Most cops that I talk to, most people that I talk to that are cops are overconfident. They put off this overconfident thing, but inside they're like, am I doing that right? Really? Should, like, is that right? And then, you know, the acquired capability, we're naturally, you can't be a cop if you don't naturally run towards the fight. We normally hate bullies. We normally want to stop the pain. We normally want to counteract or change something because it's happened to us in the past. And then that identity, well, we we're, we're longing for a place to belong and a place to actually fully fit in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that the third one that I mentioned, you know, all of them are important. All of them have, all of them are important to study and really understand. But that third one, that acquired capability, I think is especially important to, to be mindful of not only for first responders, for law enforcement, but, but the the management side too, Mm. because this acquired capability piece is really the necessary last step someone has to have to sort of override their self-preservation tendencies right like from from like caveman days we are we are wired as humans to stay alive right and so from a cognitive perspective you really have to overcome those self-preservation tendencies to ultimately commit suicide to die by suicide and so i think that acquired capability, that occupational trauma, that desensitization uh, to pain and suffering is something that I think we as an industry need to be much more uh, mindful of. Um, and, and it's something too that uh, I train about, not 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 just now, but I, I, I actually started teaching for POST, which I know you're familiar is uh, yeah. police officer standards and training here in California. And I started helping a a retired police chief named uh, Rick Wall. He was a, was, and still is a really great mentor for me, but we taught an eight hour class called suicide by cop. I still teach this to this day because they love the curriculum so much. And, and my sort of part in this was teaching the suicidology part. And then at the end, uh, the last hour, we would sort of tie in officer wellness, suicide prevention, and, and that last hour was was like this incredible hit, right? We just go through like seven hours of shit and suicide and death and dying and pain. And then the last hour we talk about, hey, you know, we went through a lot of stuff here. Here's how you can take care of yourself. Here are things that you can think about tonight as you sort of de-stress and process everything that we've that we've gone through and and honestly this class was and still is super popular especially that last hour um which to me is is really promising because i do think we're really good about training you know what if someone's trying to kill me we're really good about that but what if the person trying to kill me is me why do i not have training for that and so that's really important for me because this is something that I have gone through myself. And so to sort of um, bring that up and, and mention that, you know, uh, if we fast forward to sort of mid 2020, uh, I've been a cop for a few years and, and I've at this point just really been struggling mentally. Um, at this time, my department was very understaffed. We were very overworked. Many organizational and occupational stressors, not a ton of supportive mechanisms in place. And honestly, I didn't really have many healthy coping skills. And I think the sort of underlying foundation to it all was I really struggled with the reality of sacrificing my relationship with my family, especially my young son at this point, um, for my job, right? And, And this is also the year, as you know, this was the year of COVID, George Floyd's death, the start of the the defund the police movement. And so I would struggle at home, go into work. And because of the uniform that I wore, I would be consistently spit on, cursed at, assaulted. One time I was told I should be raped. 
just because of my occupation. And, and so because of that identity piece, which I've mentioned, I took that as, you know, an attack against Stephanie, because at this point I had completely over-identified with my job, with my career. Um, and so, so I was really struggling and, and lots of moral injuries sort of tacked onto that. Um, and I just, I felt, I felt that I was just really handcuffed in, in doing what I originally had signed up to do. You know, we all get into this industry to, to make a difference and protect and serve. And, and I couldn't really do that during this time period. Um, I couldn't be proactive. It was impossible to feel any sense of purpose back then. And I just had a really hard time accepting all of that, plus some other traumas and stuff that I didn't do a good job processing. So I think the culmination of all of that was uh, my breaking point was on a particular day uh, at 7 a.m. I had just worked 13 hours, got home, and really for no articulable reason, at least at this point, I hysterically broke down. I was by myself. Uh, in my home, I was crying hysterically, and I think everything just caught up to me. And so I grabbed my off-duty gun that I had in my night nightstand next to me, and I started ideating about my death, about my suicide, and how it really was the only option that I saw at that point to end this this incessant, nonstop psychological pain. But for reasons that I can't really even to this day explain. At one point, I, I sort of snapped out of it for lack of a better phrase and, and recognized in myself all of the indicators that I had been teaching and studying up to this point. And so I ended up reaching out for help and saw a law enforcement specific psychologist, which I think is very important, right? That that culture uh, competency as they call it these days. Um, I saw her for several months. I also went on antidepressants, which helped me tremendously. And, and, you know, for the record, I don't have to mention the medication side of things, but I do like to share it because us here in law enforcement, us as an industry, I think one thing that we're doing really, really, really wrong is we are not recognizing that there is a stigma still attached to mental health, help and maintenance, right? It's like, if you are not 100% perfect mentally, you are therefore by default found to be questionable and maybe not fit for duty, um, which means for me, and I'm sure for you, for many of us, we think we're going to get our gun and badge taken away. At least that's what I thought at this time. And so this mental health stigma aspect, I think, is, is something that we definitely need to do better at because this is definitely still alive uh, today. Um, but ultimately, that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, for me departing law enforcement in 2022 and, and parlaying into the things that I do now. That's heavy. That's, uh, I didn't even I know that. I so, that with you. I know. No, I, I didn't. I, I, I was like, when, I, when it started to go that way, I was like, oh, wow. No, I have not heard that before. No. Okay, cool. You know, you're, I've done 160. 60 something interviews with people you're like the third person that's told me that they've like been ready to do it and something's changed very few people will actually talk about it so i praise you for that like it's something that's it's it's a big one because you know i never got there but I, like i said well, we also don't i mean i guess i had the thoughts but never had the the means because I, all my firearms were at my dad's house pretty much most of the time, yeah. but I never thought about that. My question, and I always ask this and you know, this Stephanie, we've had long conversations about this. What could have been done differently so mm -hmm. that you never got there? Mm -hmm. And I know like I'm looking for a magic for magic bullets all the time, but there's gotta be something that we can do that we keep the, because law enforcement, you know, I, I I totally get. We can't have soft, you know. I, I think of I think of bad boys all the time. You think of you know you think of um, Will Smith and I can't remember their names off the top of my head right now. My brain's not working as usual. 
but you've got Will Smith, who's like that hard, badass, like cool, like every guy wants to be like him kind of thing. And then you have his partner who's like gets to that stage where he's like, no, let's talk our feelings out. And like you you can't like you can't have that cop all the time. Like you've got to have like this combo of both. And so we've got to keep that that that, you know, when shit's got to get done, it's got to get done. But we also need to be able to feel ourselves. We also need to have that compassionate, caring part of ourselves and be able to bounce between the two, you know, easily. What's how do we how do we prevent more people from get, how do we prevent people from getting to where you did, where so many other people that I've talked to, I know have, but won't even talk about it that I almost got to. How do we yeah. stop this, Stephanie? Like, how do we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It- I, I share I share the same sentiment, you know, before I answer your question. This was something that I have probably asked, interviewed hundreds mm-hmm. of clinicians, experts, uh, people that were suicidal and lived, um, asking just that that same question. And and one thing one thing that I found astonishing is the more I ask clinicians, that deal especially with first responder related mental health it was like yeah yeah this is like to be expected um one clinician actually told me he put it this way he said expecting a first responder to go through their career without negative mental health impacts is like expecting someone to walk through water not get wet and i was like okay well fuck uh then so 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 here's my thing with that though is okay cool I expect that like I tell all my clients that I'm helping to get into law enforcement look you're going to go through shit here's some shit to, so you don't actually go through it as bad and that you can actually bring yourself back right but there's got to be a way to prevent the gun going in the mouth <laughs> right yeah and and honestly hearing that I was pissed off for a while because yeah same oh. I was like well if this is such an expected thing then why the hell was I not told about this why why did I go through the academy and FTO and I went through hundreds of hours of training and not one not one Chris did I ever be talked about lectured educated on the mental health aspect the impacts from this job not one see whereas I've got different I've I was told I was told that yeah you're gonna you're gonna lose friends you're gonna you know, you're going to have all these different things happen. Yeah. And also I've interviewed people that were told there's, you know, you'll probably become as part of the statistics, divorce, domestic, alcoholic, suicide, you know, mental health stuff, yeah. PTSD, but not once are they ever, is anybody ever given effective yeah. things that change it, that well, stop and, it. and, and not I- just at Academy, but throughout their career. And you know why? It's because of this stigma. No one talks about this because of this stigma. And it's killing us, seriously. Um, because you know I'm a I'm a psych nerd. Um, one 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 stat that I usually throw out there is in 2020, which was my worst year by far, right? That's my darkest time. There were 437 officers across the US that died, not just by suicide, but died total. So 437, which by the way is a 96% increase from the year before. Um, So of that 437 officers that died, 173 of those deaths were due to suicide. That is 173 police officers that killed themselves, dozens of kids that are left without mommy and daddy. The world has lost 173 warriors. This is heartbreaking. Is that active duty or is that retired as well? uh, That is just active duty to my knowledge that that is according to blue helps statistics. And I believe that was just active duty. Yeah. And and I imagine they're retired. Yeah. I'm sure that figure is much higher. So to answer your initial question, what can we be doing better? How do we sort of fight this? I talk about this exact thing in my book because I, I'm just like, yeah, I'm all about solutions, right? I don't want to just bitch about a problem. I want to actually like, like figure (laughs) out like, what can I do about it? And so I came up with this this acronym, WARRIOR, right? Many of us identify as warriors. And so using the acronym WARRIOR are sort of the mitigating preventative steps that that when used a certain way, which I detail throughout the book, um, can really help to 
prevent this work aside, this death by career, this workplace contributing, uh, contributing factors to suicide. So W is for wellness, A, awareness, R, building resilience, other R, having lots of resources, I, identity, but an identity that's multifaceted. You are more than just your career. O, openness, and then R, routine. And so highlighting all seven of these is, is really important from a preventative standpoint. That like, yeah, it's, 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 it's funny. We all, like I said earlier on, it's a lot of the, well, in the intro, it's a lot of similar things. You know, I've been to multiple conferences, wellness conferences, personal development conferences, and they all talk about stuff in very similar ways. I want to know your intake. If somebody's going to, well, I guess where's the, where's, how, do, how does somebody start so they make sure, because I know that there's a lot of departments out there that are running like one day trainings or they'll run their whole department through a training and then that training is left and now they move on to the next thing the next year and they did how do people make sure that they actually keep this or how do departments or workplaces like what's your take on making sure that it stays a habit because i know like even myself i learned stuff five years ago when i left law enforcement that you know or business stuff went to a, when i was back in the u.s earlier this year went to a went to a business thing with my mentor because you know he wanted me there and to be you know testimonial and all this different stuff and I'm sitting there in the conference going why did I stop doing that yeah yeah this has to be a cultural shift to be quite frank with you and I love this question because this is the exact reason why I went back to school yet again I'm getting my PhD in organizational psychology of course you are um, I don't think I don't think <laughs> I had talked I told you that a while back of course but you yeah. are I think I don't have enough things going on, but, but yes. Yeah, so that is the important piece here. That is the missing, the missing piece to this puzzle is it has to start from top down leadership. That is really the best way that we can make this be a habit. We can make this be a positive culture and we can at least slow, if not completely eradicate these workplace contributing factors to suicide for our law enforcement. Um, and, and this is what I teach. I talk, I speak on this now. And, you know, law enforcement, whether you are a dispatcher, a slick sleeve, a supervisor, this job will change you, right? You will say that. I say that. So if what is predictable is preventable, then why are we not applying this logic to first responder mental health, right? And so to your point, that is one thing that, that I am trying to hopefully help with now is I... Um, I'm helping with this organizational psychology piece where uh, I sort of uh, go in as a contractor. I look at the department, figure out where can we improve. I give some suggestions. I'm also coming up with surveys to sort of understand the department temperature before we implement any sort of wellness strategies and then do these surveys every six to 12 months to really understand what works for this for this department. Because every department has its own culture, right? So it's it's not... It's not a blanket answer. It has to be specific. And the best way that we can get specific is by trying to use certain metrics to figure that out. But I think it does need to start with the department. Yeah, so, so true. To shift just a little bit, because you said around your purpose, you know, you said you, you talk about purpose a lot, you know, the four things, you know, making sure that you have that identity. And I'm a huge, we've had, again, on conversations about this you know i'm a huge identity person and have the way that i believe and where i believe it comes from but what is stephanie's identity not the work stephanie but stephanie's identity or purpose yeah, yeah that's a really good question so if you were to ask me this a few years ago my answer would be completely different <laughs> but nowadays i sort of had to create some a very visual person this hierarchy and the very top of my my triangle very top of my hierarchy the very first thing that I am is I am a faithful person so I I do put religion there on the top for me below that I am a wife I'm a wife to a deputy he is still working 
Um, and so being able to help him get through a lot of the difficult traumatic things is, is of my utmost importance. Uh, I also am a mom and those three things are the top three things for me. They have always been, but did I recognize it? No, I didn't. And honestly, it wasn't until I visited a first responder specific inpatient treatment center where I saw first responders, uh, namely dispatch police officers and uh, fire personnel who have attempted to die by suicide and have, have lived or have indirectly attempted to kill themselves by self-medicating with an egregious amount of drugs and alcohol. It really wasn't until I was in that space and really immersed into everything that they had gone through up until this point where they highlighted, you know, I lost my family. I lost my wife. I lost my husband. I lost my kids for what? For this career, because I didn't do a good job or I didn't know how to survive the impacts that this job has on me. And there were many of them that just said, you know, I want what you have. I want a wife. I want a husband. I want my kids back. And so I kid you not, I spent five days in this first responder only treatment center, residential uh, treatment center. I go home and that was the most loving, the most present I have ever been with my family from that point on. And so I think that perspective is really important to remember again, we are more than just our jobs, right? Eventually we will leave our job, whether it's through a Hearst, voluntary or involuntary means, like we will eventually leave our job. But our family, that is the people, that is the unit that should get the best of the best of us, not the leftovers. And it took me a while to realize that. Yeah, no, it's it's so it's so true. You know, without family, we we don't have anything, and without ourselves, we don't have family. Yeah. And yeah. so we've got to look after ourselves. You know, I talk about the, the the pyramid that I came up with. You know, it's nothing new, but the pyramid that I came up with after I left law enforcement because I stopped looking after myself. So in turn, I actually begrudged my family because I felt like I was putting more time into them than myself. So mm -hmm. I've got the pyramid kind of like you have. It starts at the bottom. The tip, of the, uh, let's start, I'll start how you did it. The tip at the very top is work and everybody else. Then it's relationship and family. And then it's myself. So the bottom foundation level is me. Because without yourself, you don't have anything. Without family and relationships, you don't have anything else. You don't have anything above that. And, you know, then works at the very top. Work changes. Yeah. Every yeah, day. and I suppose on a on a professional end, uh, the professional end of the spectrum, um, I do a lot of talking, I do a lot of course creation, um, uh, presentation creation for first responder departments, occasionally corporations too, but mostly first responder departments. Um, so I do a lot of trainings, a lot of keynote speaking. Uh, I'm a writer. I do a lot of articles, blogs, things like that. As you know, I came uh, am coming out with a book. Uh, the yeah. end of September, early October. And then I also have a course. And so I'm hoping by sort of tying all of this information that I'm sort of putting into the universe, it will hit the people that it, that it needs to hit at that time, meeting that person where they are at that time, whether that's talking about contentedness or ways to boost uh, individual wellness, ways to incorporate organizational psychology so employees are happier and healthier, wherever people are that need to hear that information. I'm hoping to just put it out there, shotgun spray it to as many people as I can. Um, so hopefully it lands where it needs to. No, that's awesome. All okay. right. Where can people find, I know the book's not out yet, but where will they be able to find it? As well as I know you've got a course out that is stupidly cheap for what you're getting um, for all the work and research and effort that you put into it. Uh, I am featured on it. Thank you very much. Um, but, uh, Stephanie, how do people find the course and how will be, people be able to find the book when it comes out? Yeah. Uh, so if people go to my website, which is Stephanie I'll make sure that Chris has that information. Cause my name is kind of fucked up. You can blame my husband for that. Uh, but <laughs> Stephanie Uh, 
uh, you can go there. Uh, I would encourage you to, um, for those that are interested in, in being one of the first to get the book, you can enter your email, be notified of updates and book information. And then there's also a, a course that's listed there as well that, that uh, Chris, yes, is a part of. Uh, gave some really, really amazing <laughs> information and education in his segment. Um, and, and also extra resources like webinars, downloadable goodies. Um, so those that that go to get my book and um, uh, get it when it's on pre-sale will get some extra goodies as well. But stephaniekiso.com has lots of really great information on how to uh, boost individual well-being through that warrior acronym, what I call the warrior way ways to overcome a toxic workplace, how to design your environment to increase wellness, whether that's on a professional and or personal end, and really identifying these contributing factors to work-related suicidal thoughts and behaviors, not only in ourselves, but for others as well. So this material was really designed for a lot of different people. Obviously, first responders are, are at the top of my list, but also medical professionals, um, uh, those that that work in the the medical space, you know, the any any high stress, high performance employee likely resonates with a lot of the things that we've talked about, um, and and really anyone that wants a happier and healthier life. So I'm hoping that this information will help a lot of people. No, definitely. I uh, just from the bits that I've seen as you've been developing it, and that from you know the back end side, it's uh, it's it's going to be impressive. Uh, so make sure you get over there and, and and have a look at that. We'll put the link down in the description down below. Stephanie, what would you say the number one outcome if somebody goes through your course? I know right now you've got it discounted as well at the time of this recording. I don't know if yep. it will be when this goes live. The book yes, will probably will. be just about pretty much out. So it will be on discount probably when this goes first live. So if you're one of the first listeners, make sure you get over there, have a look at it. Uh, and, you know, I know the book will probably be coming out sometime around the time that this, that this episode is dropping. So if you're listening to this, make sure you go have a look uh, and I will... Um, Hopefully, if it is out, I'll link the I'll link the exact link straight to it, uh, straight to the book as well, uh, down below. So, what would you say is the number one? Because I'm an outcome person, so I always like to think about the outcome. What do you think the number one outcome is that somebody would get by going through the course or reading the book? Are they different or are they the same? I think. I've never been asked that. That's a good question. You're I, I know. I like it. So I think that depending on the mental space someone is in, the outcome might be slightly different, right? Maybe they need to focus on the wellness piece, the awareness piece, building up their resource list. It can be different depending on where we are, but it will be the same in that I think the underlying theme here is we need to focus on us. And you don't have to be perfect to make progress, right? Really just each day, if you focus on being just a little bit better than, than you were the day before, whether that's learning a new skill, taking on a new challenge, or really just showing up with a positive attitude, um, each small step forward, whether reading the book or taking the course, will likely be contagious in a good way. So not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping those around you because they're going to notice that you're just a little bit happier, a little bit healthier each and every day. And when that happens, you start to be able to help more and do more and impact more, which is the whole reason that especially law enforcement get into doing what they're doing. Everybody wants to help people. You can't help people if you can't help yourself. We say That's it all the time. But anyways, uh, awesome, Stephanie. So uh, anything else that you'd like to add or let viewers or listeners know at this time? No, just go to stephaniekiso.com. I think there's going to be a lot of really great uh, information, a lot of great insight there, uh, similar to what we're talking about, but maybe more in depth. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the eight dimensions of wellness and why that's important. So specifically, the course is about uh, those eight dimensions of wellness. And in 10 weeks, which is why Chris calls this stupidly cheap, because uh, the price, the special price here is much less than, than a price of a, a lunch meal uh, eaten out for sure. Uh, but... Um, it, this course really walks someone who is probably struggling at work, maybe in a toxic work environment, through a very specific plan to focus on one aspect of wellness at a time. So for those who are not familiar with the eight dimensions of wellness, it's physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, 
social, environmental, occupational, and financial. So all eight of those is important for our identity, right? We've talked a lot about identity. Uh, and, and neglecting one affects the others. And so this course really helps individuals boost self-care, wellness, and overall well-being in both a professional and, and personal life. So I think that course would, would, would really help a lot of people. And then, of course, the book um, has just a plethora of information. I'm so grateful to all of the experts, Chris included, that contributed to this book. I mean, there are gosh, I, dozens, I, I, I lost count, dozens of experts that that comment uh, firsthand uh, experiences of people who have been in that darkness, who have experienced similar experiences such as myself. And then at the very end, there's something called the BFLR, the big fat list of resources. And so it is literally page upon page upon page upon page of resources, who that resource is for, where you can go, depending on what you're struggling with. And so I really think that's going to help a lot of people. Yeah, no, I definitely will. And I can tell you this hands down from talking with Stephanie, you know, I don't even know everything that's in the book or in the course. Uh, but from what I have seen, it's a lot of stuff I wish I had had when I when I joined up that I wish I wish somebody with experience and somebody further down the track that I resonated with had said, Chris, you have to read this in the beginning before I was at a dark place. Because when I was at a dark place, people used to throw me resources. But once I was in that dark place, I was just, I didn't care. Like somebody told me, I mean, you, I know you're familiar, you're probably familiar with it. Law, um, emotional survival for law enforcement. Almost every single cop knows that book. I got told about it about a dozen times when I was in my darkness. And that, did I read it? No. It took me three years after I left to actually then go, wait a second, there was that book that, and so grab Stephanie's book when it's, you know, if, if, if it's out already or go get on the short list, get on the pre, the pre-sale list, go grab it, grab the course. I, I spent more on dinner with my wife last weekend than the course cost. And it was a cheap dinner. So <laughs> just like go, like, just go grab it. It's, it's, it's worth it. You, you won't regret it. Um, Stephanie, last question. I always like to ask, uh, um, you know, those that are here is what is your top tip to self-happiness? Hmm. My top tip to self-happiness might be a little unconventional, but it is what is popping up at the top of my head. So I'm going to go with it. Uh, you apparently are really good about asking questions I've never been asked before. So um, <laughs> this is going to be a fun one. And I apologize. To anyone, and I apologize to anyone who, uh, who might be offended by my, my, um, Ah, it's, moment, it's, but... it's, it's your it's your thing so you're allowed you don't need to be apologetic don't be, my, my be top... unapologetic it's your thing <laughs> <laughs> my top tip to happiness is don't give a fuck anymore and here's why I say that <laughs> here's why I say that I say that for a specific reason when I was a cop even when I was a dispatcher to be to be honest I was so worried about my reputation about pleasing the popular people about having this persona that would hopefully help me get to where I wanted to go in my career. I learned very quickly that that is oftentimes not the case. And nowadays I get to be the voice for a lot of people who don't feel like they have a voice. When I was a cop and I was a dispatcher, I felt very muffled, very voiceless. I could not voice what I was struggling with, what I needed help with because I was worried about offending people or coming across as weak. And nowadays I don't give a fuck. So if I can help someone by being their voice, by talking about the things that need to be talked about, that ultimately is the path, not only for my own happiness, but hopefully for a lot of other people. I love that. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it, you know, it's funny. You say that it's, you know, it's something that people might not like. It's exactly what I say. Because it's oh, okay. exact, it's it's exactly true. Before I was a cop, I didn't care. My wife was like, "You don't really care what people." No, I don't care. Whatever, just like let's keep going. Yeah. As a cop, I started caring. I started caring. Now I was I'm out. Fuck all of you. I don't really care. If you don't like this, go find something that's different. If you do like it, cool. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Share it around. Give it to somebody else, and you know, go get Stephanie's book and course. There you go. And and if you need more help and you want anything else, reach out to me. The links are down in the description. Um. Stephanie, any last words before before we wrap up? Research has shown that, of course, I have to end something nerdy here. That's okay. Research you're doing has your shown. PhD. You're doing your PhD. Sorry, you're doing your PhD. Of course, you can end with some like 
good information. Really nerdy statistic. Research has shown over and over and over again that those that actually reach out for help are not weak. They actually are the strongest of the bunch. And, and why I mean that is this, that stigma again that we've been talking about, it's perceived that if you ask for help, if you need help, you're weak. But actually research factually shows and confirms that the opposite is true. Those that have higher levels of resilience, those that have more social connectedness and have higher IQs are actually the ones that reach out for help. So if you feel like that is you, please know it is you are not weak for reaching out for help. And in fact, you are quite the opposite. Reaching out for help is one of the strongest things you can do. So I just want to end with that. Love it. I love it. Well, Stephanie, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for taking the time. From the other side of the world, uh, before we started recording, we did talk. I had a puffer jacket and everything. I was like, I better take this off because it's, I'm in New Zealand. You're in California. It's unseasonally hot in California. It's unseasonally, well, not unseasonally, but it is just cold here at the moment. Uh, but thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time, Stephanie. Anybody who's still listening or watching, uh, thank you very much for, for being here, for supporting the channel. Uh, please do like, share, subscribe, uh, get this out to somebody that you know, you know, go have a look at Stephanie's website links down in the, in the description down below. Uh, and we will um, talk to you again, Stephanie, I know that we'll have we'll have you back on we'll be talking about some probably once you have your PhD, or I don't know, once you have more letters behind your name, then you know, then whatever i'm going to give you crap about that forever just fyi because, i know you will i know because you will. i have no no i have no letters so you know it, those that are below you do have to try and drag you back down to you know my level but <laughs> no we're just shouting with you but again like i said in the very beginning take one thing away from today stephanie's given a lot of tools given a lot of insights you know just take one thing away and i'd love wherever you're listening or watching this drop a comment if you can send us an email i can forward it through to stephanie what's your biggest takeaway what did you enjoy the most and i always like to have this it does hurt a little bit sometimes but what did you hate the most so that we can shift and change it this is the only way to get better is know what people don't what people like so you can keep doing it what people don't like so you can shift and change it if you need to be uh, again, you can reach out to me at uh, createfromy.com. That's createfromwhy.com uh, or go to createfromy uh, at gmail.com and send us an email uh, and um, we will get back to you with a, whatever query that you have. Till next time, my motto is always train hard, test easy because we're always being tested. So we may as well train for it. Uh, and until next time, stay safe out there, guys. And we love you all.